He looks over and he begins by saying, arise and shine. Arise and shine. And while I was praying, I was thinking about uh, the prophetic task, the prophetic call, and how this is a season that requires the believers of Christ to be prophetic. Not so much so just foretelling, but also foretelling. Being able to see and seize our God-ordained future. And if we're going to adequately navigate and steward this moment that we are in, it requires intentionality, it requires intimacy, and ultimately it will require us to steward our influence properly. I want to start there for just a moment if you're taking notes. It requires intimacy. Intimacy with God that gives us clarity concerning where we are. Intimacy with God that gives us the ability of how to navigate these moments. These moments are moments that are unprecedented. And when I was in prayer a few weeks ago, the Spirit of the Lord impressed upon me. He said, son, this is a season in which there are no experts. In which you are only able to know what to do by leaning and depending upon me. And so with unction and with urgency, I want to encourage you who are listening uh, all across the world, no matter if you're listening on your couch or even if you're an essential worker and you have a moment for a break, I want to remind you that in this moment, maintain your posture in the presence of God. Because it is that posture in the presence of God that will bring peace and that will also bring clarity according to your purpose. And many are trying to figure out how to discern and how to decipher purpose in this moment and how to decipher navigating a time in which we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. We don't know how else to turn. And in moments like that, you must lean in to have an ear toward heaven, to have heaven's perspective as it pertains to what it is he has spoken to you. And when God speaks to the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah himself writes in over 66 chapters, indicative of even our 66 books of the Bible. He is known as the evil eye prophet. He is one that has the ability to see beyond, beyond the moment that they lived in. So much so that even Jesus consistently recites from the prophet Isaiah, even when he begins to declare and begins his three and a half ministry throughout all of Israel. And this same Isaiah is now having another moment with God that enables us to have a picture of what to do when it gets dark. And I want to share just for a few moments on this Resurrection Sunday, uh, I want to share with you because uh, we understand that Jesus uh, received victory when he was resurrected from the grave over death hell and everything else but one thing i want us to understand while it looks dark in america while it looks dark over the airways while it looks dark all over the world god is up to something right now and it may not look like it it may not seem like it but i have stand before you this morning as a prophet of god to tell you God is working behind the scenes. I remember when I was in junior high school and was blessed to be a part of some productions and they always liked me to share because they liked how I talked and so I would normally be the narrator. I would sometimes play the one with the God voice and all of that as a kid because I had been preaching so young they were able to use my voice and so I was over behind the curtains and the curtains are being lifted and while the curtains are being lifted they're setting the stage. I want you to hear me prophetically for just a moment. I feel my flow happening now. Feel the Holy Ghost flowing Hello. through me now. And while they were setting the stage, they're setting the stage for the actors to come on. They're setting the stage so that everything could be in order for what was getting ready to come. So all of the work, all of the preparation was to make sure that the stage was being set. So what people saw on the front end was the curtains being closed. So they saw on the front end the curtains being closed. They did not see what was happening in the back. They did not see the actors being nervous. They did not 
not see the students running around. They did not see the stage hands not knowing what else to do. All they saw was the stage bare. They did not know what was happening behind the scenes. And I came to tell you this morning, on the unction of the Holy Ghost, it doesn't seem like much is happening because the stage is bare. But God is working behind the scenes. And it may not look like it now, but surely you're going to see his hand upon your life. If you believe it, right where you are, say amen to me. Amen. I came to let somebody know this morning, even if I don't know what's going to happen to my next paycheck, God is working behind the scenes. Even if I don't know what's going to happen to the things around me, God is working behind the scenes. And God will be glorified even when I don't know what's going to happen next. Even when I'm not sure what's going to happen next. Because God is God. And God is just. And God is still on the throne. He's got all of this thing in control. Yes. Yes. Prophet Isaiah speaks prophetically because he has to speak to a people who have been hounded by hopelessness. Mm. <laughs> Lord. And I came to tell somebody this morning that's been hounded by hopelessness. Hounded by helplessness. There's some good news on this Easter Sunday. That even while I feel as if I'm hounded by helplessness, God is my help. Yes. Notice, Prophet Isaiah begins to speak. And I want to lay this as a bridge for where I'm going. I'm going somewhere. Prophet Isaiah begins to speak. The power of this text is not so much just Isaiah 60 and 1. But it's what precedes Isaiah 60 and 1. Let's go a step deeper just for a moment. Notice in Isaiah 59, verse 21. Won't you get an appetite for the word? It says, as for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. So God, in the middle of captivity, makes a covenant with his people. You need to understand. We are living in a society in which many are being furloughed, in which many uh, uh, unemployment rates have, have tripled and quadrupled so much so that even the websites have begun to crash. Therefore, we're living in a society in which contracts are being violated. In which contracts are no longer valid. In which contracts and things and promises that people made and bonuses that were supposed to come. Everybody's beginning to pull out of their stuff. And so we're living in a society in which we're seeing the erosion of public trust. But what does God say in Isaiah 59, 21? He says, as for me, says the Lord. That's, 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 we got to stop right there for just a moment. God makes a promise. And when God makes a promise, his promise shall come to pass. It's not a maybe. It's a maybe when it's with man. But it's absolutely certain when it's with God. And if we're going to navigate this season effectively, we've got to make sure we are aligned properly with the right person. I'm not going to allow what society says to dictate my response. I'm going to eat fresh manna from heaven for what God has to say about what I'm experiencing. Yes. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant. Isaiah 59, 21. This is my covenant with them. I am so much God I'm going to make a promise. I'm going to give them an offer, if you will, Godfather Richard, man is watching, that they can't even refuse. Mm. <laughs> this is my covenant with them. My spirit, hallelujah, who is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth or from your descendants or from your descendants' descendants says the Lord from this time and forevermore.
anymore. What are you saying, preacher? What I'm saying to you is uh, the promises of God, even when everything is shaken, don't leave your mouth. Uh, you got to make sure you're speaking the word uh, yes. over every situation. Yes. Speaking the word over every circumstance. Speaking the word over everything. Uh, you need to speak healing over your body, even if you're not sick. Uh, speak the word of God uh, over everything around you. Command your house to be blessed. Uh, command your house to be covered under the blood. Command family you don't like uh, to be covered under the blood. Uh, speak the word of God uh, over your situation. Situation for God says, as for me, yes, this is, this is, this is my covenant with them. I want to go a step deeper now. Notice, he says in Isaiah fifty nine, Hallelujah! Oh, glory to God! I feel my help now. Isaiah fifty nine twenty one. My spirit is upon you, and my words I put in your mouth. Then in Isaiah 60 and 1, he says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Let's, let's stop right there for a minute. Notice, I'm going to kill my media, folks. Just stay with me. Notice, in Isaiah 59 and 21, he says, You are going to obey what I've put in you. And then in Isaiah 60 and 1, he says, the glory of the Lord shall be upon you. The you in Isaiah 59 and 21 is not the same you in Isaiah 60 and 1. Stay with me. In Isaiah 59 and 21, that you is the masculine article. Mm. In Isaiah 60 and 1, Make it plain. that you is the feminine article. What's the difference, Bishop? The distinction is in the you in Isaiah 459 and 21. He is not speaking to the you, the people of God. It is God speaking to himself. Mm. You need to hear what I'm saying. My, my, my. So the you in Isaiah 59 and 21 is the masculine article, which means it's a conversation in the mind of God. Woo. It is God, the Father, speaking to his son. Mm. And he's saying to his son, don't forget the promises uh, because the descendants, descendants, descendants uh, are the 40 and two generations uh, that you're going to come through. Uh, so when you redeem mankind, uh, oh, you better hear what I'm saying this Ooh. morning. So it is God speaking to himself, uh, a promise for his people that then the next verse, Isaiah 60 and 1, uh, speaks to the feminine article. Lord. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The distinction in 59 and 21 is to the masculine article. God speaking to himself. It is a picture of what Jesus says before he gets on the cross. <laughs> mm. In John chapter 17. Yes. When he says, Lord, my prayer is not that you would take them out of the world. And we need to read our Bibles because a whole lot of modern prophecy people are saying because of the calamity we see right now that God's going to quickly take us out of it. All. He says, my prayer, John 17, is not that you take them out of the world, but that you might be glorified while they go through it. So what are you saying, God? I'm saying that I want a people who trust me so much yes. that they are pressing through tribulation. Yes. They are pressing through problems. They're not ducking and hiding when problems come, but they stand up because they know they have a supernatural bulletproof vest on. Try your best shot, but I'm still standing. Yes. Isaiah 59. 21. Woo! Glory to God. Yes, Lord. It's speaking to the masculine article. But Isaiah 61. Speaking to the feminine article. Which means what? He's speaking to Zion in 61. Which is then the people of God. <laughs> so, in 59 and 21. God is talking to himself. In Isaiah 60 and 1, God is speaking to his people. Mm. So it goes from 
Father and the Son and the Spirit having a conversation to the Spirit now being poured out upon a covenant community. Which is why, even though we're not gathered, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we are now scattered, Acts chapter 8 verse 1. Because Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And the disciples said, oh, that's very nice, very lovely. But they didn't know that the way that was going to happen was for trouble to come. And when Acts chapter 8 verses 1 comes, now they're actually in the uttermost parts, but they've been scattered. Is it possible that God moves us from being gathered to scattered to, to rediscover who he is? Yes. yes. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1 says, The you there, feminine article, speaks of the city of God, it speaks of the people of God. So we're now moving from what God is promising to himself through the cross to now in Isaiah 60, what he has promised to us as a covenant people. And I want to remind you this morning, do not neglect the promises of God over your life. No matter how crazy it gets, no matter how chaotic it gets, don't forget what God has promised you. Because God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. So notice the before and the after. Notice the before and the after. I want to go another. I want to go another way with this. Notice how in Isaiah fifty nine and twenty one, there are two things we see. We see a reference to my spirit and a reference to my word. A reference to the spirit and a reference to the word. So it is the perfect fusion between word and spirit. Word and spirit. And too many times what we're finding in church today especially is that those are polar opposites. And so you'll have those who are focused specifically just on the word and those who focus just on the spirit. But notice, notice the prophet is commanded, God is speaking directly and says that the word and the spirit work together. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 3. Just before I go there, I want to look at Isaiah 61 again. Now he says to them, arise. Shine. Arise. Shine. It was not a suggestion. It was a command. What he was saying is, it's dark, but you got to get up. It doesn't necessarily look all like it's supposed to, but you've got to get up. Why? Arise and shine for your light has come. Who is the light? I heard Jesus say, I am the light yes. of the world. Therefore, I understand that in order for me to fully know who he is and who I am in him, I have to hide in plain sight. Because he is the light of the world. Arise and shout. I don't want you just to get up, but I want you to shine. Why? Because this darkness cannot overtake you. And so you got to understand that the darker it gets, the brighter my glory becomes. Notice he says, arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. So the glory of the Lord rises as we arise. The glory of the Lord rises as we arise. So when we get up, he gets up with us. We've heard of him. Uh, Jesus said, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw men unto me. 
He's gotten up already. We got to get up. Amen. Yes. He says, arise and shine for your light has come and the glory. In the Greek, that word is doxa. In the Hebrew, it's the word kavod. Kavod. Or in the Hebrew, another way they said, you said kavod. Uh, it literally means weight. It's splendor. It means authority. It means magnificence. It means glorious. It means honor. It means renown. So he says, arise and shine. And my weight shall be upon you. My power shall be upon you. My presence shall be upon you. My glory shall be upon you. So much so that you are not backing you. You've got some behind the scene investors. Holy Ghost. Symbiotically. Investing in us. To give us that which we must say. In the time. And the season. That we are called to say it. That's why. Very quickly I want us to go to Isaiah 50. I need to teach this for a moment. Because a lot of you are going through things. And I want you to be fortified in your faith. Notice what he says. In Isaiah 50. Verse number 4. The Lord has given me. The Lord has given me. The tongue of the learned. That I should know how to speak a word in season. To him who is weary. We see all around us. Weariness. Therefore we need wisdom from God. To speak into the weariness. And I want to take a moment right now. I don't know who's listening to me from wherever you are. But I speak to the weariness in your spirit. The weariness in your mind. The weariness in your heart. And I declare in the name of the Lord Jesus that God is supernaturally touching your body, touching your mind, touching your heart in Jesus' name. He says there, the Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. And he awakens my ear. He awakens my consciousness. He awakens me to be able to have a discerning ear to know and to show the way that I am to go. To know and show the way that I am to go. Now, behold, verse 2 of Isaiah 60, darkness shall cover the earth. He didn't say it might. The darkness shall cover the earth. I'm talking about how to navigate moments we're in right now. And deep darkness the people. But. There's a but to every blessing. But the Lord will arise over you. And his glory will be seen. His glory will be visible. His glory will be tangible. Where? It will be seen upon you. This you speaks to the covenant community. The body of Christ. So as the darkness comes. He's saying don't think it might happen. It's going to come. But when it comes. The Lord will arise over the darkness. That's what resurrection is all about. Death, hell, and the grave tried to swallow Jesus up. And on Sunday, on the first Sunday, that Sunday morning, that early Sunday morning when he got up from the grave, he spit them all out with all power. Why? Because he understood that he was greater than the darkness of death. Which is why Paul says, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Yes. Oh, grave, where is thy victory? 
victory. The day death died was the day Jesus got up. Yes. And therefore we understand that we have a tangible promise that no one can ever take away. Mm. A precious gift that's not for sale in a store. Mm. You can't buy this anywhere. Come on. It's a gift that has been freely given to you from the foundations of the world. The Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. So we're not going to just feel it. We're going to see it. And I, I want to speak to you right now this morning by the Spirit of God. This is not a time for us to cave in to what we see around us. But we must be fortified. We have to breathe with those and breathe more with those and more. All of us are being hit by this in different ways. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we have to be fortified in our faith to navigate how to walk through seasons of uncertainty, seasons of darkness. I'm not preaching to you a lucky charm fruit loop gospel. I'm telling you that as a believer, there will be attacks on your life. There will be things that will happen to you. Yeah. There will be things that will come that you cannot control, but that does not negate the fact that you know who's in control over it. Yes. Amen. And we have to get back to the word of God. Darkness and deep darkness. Yet my glory shall arise over you. Come here, come here, come here. Let me, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You are not just a survivor. When this whole thing is over, somebody's going to say, oh, hey God, I survived. No, 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 no. You are not just a survivor. The glory that comes, the Lord says, and he shall arise over you. So we're not going to just survive. We, because he's over it, are overcomers. I am not just a survivor of a situation. I am not just a survivor of a test or a trial. I am an overcomer because the Lord has overcome everything I could ever endure. And when I understand that, it brings a paradigm shift. Because I see now differently according to what God said. Here's the bridge. And I'm finished with this. Here's the bridge. Acts chapter 3. Very quickly. I pray this is blessing you. Very quickly. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. Don't have time next year just like I really want to. Notice we just spent time in Isaiah before the cross. And now we are in Acts chapter 3 after the resurrection. So we hit before the cross and after the cross. Calvary now is the bridge between both testaments. And now we are in Acts chapter 3. Notice what happens here. Peter and John, Peter and John, Peter and John, constantly and consistently throughout the, the Gospels, you will find references to Peter, James, and John. Jesus is very intentional about who he allows that is in a circle and who he allows to walk with him. James, as we see, is not listed in this particular passage, but we will see him several times before his life is taken in the, in the book of Acts. Peter and John are walking together. Peter, indicative of faith, the water worker, the water walker. John, the beloved disciple, indicative of love. So we see faith and love in alignment together. These are virtues that we need in this time of helplessness and hopelessness. Faith and love are walking together. Faith and love and prayer. Faith, love, then prayer. Faith, Peter, love, John, are coming to pray. So, when we walk 
in faith and we walk with love and we have a posture of prayer, it opens the door for miracles. It opens the door for miracles. I want to tell you right now, expect a miracle. I know what everybody's saying. I know what the news is saying. I know what we're experiencing right now. But I'm telling you, expect a miracle. On the side of our church, since the beginning of our ministry, God told us, expect greater. You've got to be able to, even in the midst of this moment, watch God show up in the middle of it. They come at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. <laughs> What I love about this, I wish I had more time to deal with it. I don't want to go too far with it. But what I love about this is that this ninth hour, we will also see again. In Acts chapter 10. Mm. When a man by the name of Cornelius has a vision. And God begins to speak to him. And God begins to speak to Peter concerning him. Because God was expanding the gospel of the kingdom. Beyond people who look like each other, who acted like each other, and who talk like each other. When you look like, act alike, talk alike, and do everything alike, that's cult-like qualities. The kingdom of God is not a cult. We all don't look the same. We all don't talk the same. We all don't act the same. But the beauty is in the oneness that we have in Christ. Amen. So we begin to see this distinction of the ninth hour. Nine, of course, we know means birthing and all that. But the ninth hour. I want to stay there for just a minute. The ninth hour. The same ninth hour is seen in Acts chapter 10. It is indicative of a particular time of prayer. It begins, according to the law of first mention, in the book of Leviticus. I just want to take a moment and just, just dive in this word a little bit. Amen. It begins, according to the law of first mention, in the book of Leviticus. In the book of Leviticus we see that around this particular time period, the ninth hour, around 3 o'clock to 3.30, it was the time in which they prayed and offered up incense for the sacrifice. I'm going somewhere. It is around this time period at the temple between 2.30 p.m. and 3.30 p.m. They would pray three times a day. Daniel even did it. Morning, noon, and night. So they would pray at 9, 12, and even in the evening, later in, around 3 o'clock. This ninth hour is around 3 o'clock, contextually. Stay with me. So, it is at this time period that God decides to do something unprecedented. Never neglect the timing of God. This man had been carried every day. Carried every day in front of the gate. But this was the day of his deliverance. And I came to tell somebody, I'll give you sitting in your bed, sitting at home. This is your day of deliverance. God will pull you up out of the muck and the mire. Pull you up out of depression. Pull you up out of hopelessness. Pull you up out of loneliness. Pull you out of aloneness. And I declare in the name of Jesus that God is pulling you out even now in Jesus' name. Timing of the text. The ninth hour is indicative of when they would begin the process of slaying the lamb. <laughs> They would slay the lamb, preacher. They would slay the lamb at 2.30. Yes. And after they were slain, they would begin to offer it as a sacrifice by 3 o'clock, 3.30. So at the time of this miracle, when they're coming to pray, the lamb had already been slain. And since the lamb had already been slain, the lame would be redeemed by the slain lamb. Mm. Therefore, as they're getting ready to come to the hour of prayer, the Bible says a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, but this day stands around the gate called beautiful. Mm. 
There has been deliberations theologically between which gate this really is. Some scholars argue that it is the gate of Sushan, which is southeast of where the temple area was. Some others argue that it was the gate called Nicanor or Nicanor, which was a beautiful gate made of bronze. But here is the bridge of where I want to land. Take us to the bridge. They are there by a beautiful gate. And here lies a man in a bad situation. We see a man who is broken standing by a beautiful gate. A man who is bruised, lame in his life, standing by a beautiful gate. This same beautiful gate, the distinction between whether it was the gate of Susha or whether it was the gate of Nicanor, the distinction between both of those gates is that both of those gates were where the outsiders could stand by. Jesus is the gate mm. between sin and eternity. Lord. Jesus is the gate between helplessness and hopelessness. Yes, sir. And therefore, he's standing where the outsiders are allowed to stand. Mm. But he doesn't realize that the slain lamb was slain for the outsiders. Uh. So the insiders were passing him by. But those who had a revelation of why Jesus actually came paid attention to the man who was begging for arms. Which is why the Bible says that Paul, they look, Peter and them, they look at him intentionally. That word in the Greek means to gaze at. What were they gazing at? God was giving them x-ray vision, not into his sickness, but until the sickness of his soul. And therefore they looked at him and they said, silver and gold we do not have. Why? Because in Acts chapter 2, they gave up their possessions so that everybody could be taken care of. Silver and gold is not just a reference to physical money. Silver and gold is also in reference to the architecture of the gate. What they're saying to him is, I don't have what you see around you. Mm. But what I do have is what you really need. In the name. In the name. And I want you to know this morning. The reason why we're able to worship on Easter Sunday. The reason why we're able to worship on this Lord's Day. Is because there's power in the name. It said in the name of Jesus. Rise up mm. and walk yes, Lord. in the name of Jesus. There was a specific impotence. There was a specific importance on the name of Jesus. They said in the name of Jesus, you are coming out of this. And I want to tell you right now what they're saying, if we can contextualize it today, stimulus packages I have not. My Lord. Yeah. But such that I have, it will get you stimulated in the name of Jesus. Lord, have mercy. Get up and walk. And I came to tell this city, I came to tell this nation, I came to tell this world. Children go, we have none but such that we have. You need in the name of Jesus. Get up! And receive the promises of God. The Bible says he got up walking, leaping, and praising God. Now here is the distinction as I close with this. Here's the distinction. We see the manifestation of the miracle first. And then Peter gets to preach it. 
And Peter begins to now articulate what just happened. So it was demonstration, then proclamation. Say it again. It was demonstration, then proclamation. Normally we see proclamation, preach it, then demonstration. But there was demonstration, then proclamation, which led to transformation. I'm going to say it again. There was demonstration, then proclamation. They saw it, then he described what happened said this name that I just told you about let me tell you who he is and I want to tell you right now I want to challenge you you are the sermon that people are looking for on your pages you are the sermon that people are looking for on your Instagram stories you are the sermon people are looking for on your Snapchats you are the sermon people are looking for on YouTube you are a word from God and God will use you to demonstrate his kingdom silver and gold I have not but such that I have, I give unto you. In the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. I believe that this is a season for us as the people of God to rise up and to possess the promises of Daniel says to us in the book of Daniel, Daniel 7, the hour had come for the saints of the Most High to possess the kingdom. And I believe this is a time in which God wants the saints to possess the kingdom. He got up from the grave with all power, 